Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C., and it's our July 4th program, The Glorious Fourth. We are, of course, taping on the afternoon of Friday, July 3rd, but this program will be broadcast on July 4th, so happy Independence Day to all, and we want to offer some commentaries about themes of the Revolutionary War here in the United States and also of the Civil War, because today is July 3rd when we're taping, and that is, of course, the anniversary, the 152nd anniversary of the third day, Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. And uh, that is another tremendous historical moment. And we got to remember that July 4th, 1863, also 152 years ago, the fall of Vicksburg, the uh, liberation of Vicksburg from the Slavocrat yoke and uh, by General Grant with the Confederate Pemberton, a turncoat from Pennsylvania. And uh, that was 152 years ago, that uh, July 4th. So Gettysburg and Vicksburg uh, together already in July of 1863, meaning that the military chances of the Confederacy were already then minimal, and the only hope for the Confederate slavocrats was a crisis of defeatism in the North. The election of George McClellan, who was uh, someone who wanted to preserve slavery, uh, although he was he was interested in keeping the Union, I guess we can concede, but he wanted to preserve slavery. And unfortunately, those uh, simply could not be combined. So let's switch our attention now to the big event developing out in the world. It is the Greek referendum of Sunday, and that will be Sunday, July 5th. Won't it be nice in the future if the no wins in this referendum, we will have in some ways a world declaration of freedom from austerity, killer cuts, genocidal uh, budget manipulations, mass suicides, and the lugubrious apparatus of IMF, neoliberalism, monetarism, and other bankrupt and discredited economic doctrines. World freedom from the IMF, world freedom from austerity, from genocidal austerity and killer cuts. That's going to be the 5th of July uh, when the Greeks vote no. Ochia, no. Down with austerity, down with the IMF, down with Merkel, down with Schäuble, down with Draghi and the European Central Bank in its present form. It's got to have to be Europeanized, seized, nationalized, if you will, or uh, somehow deprivatized, maybe is a good one in this case. And, uh, of course, uh, no also to the uh, cretinous Donald Tusk and to other plug uglies of this austerity apparatus. So here's the story, right? The polls at this point are showing a close race. I wouldn't put any stock in them because we have to realize that the forces of finance capital fix the polls. That's one of the main things that they do. The forces of finance capital, their prostitutes and puppets, they go out of their way to make sure that uh, the, the, the news, news accounts are all tendentious and the polls are all fixed. It's all psychological warfare. So we call on the Greeks, Hellenes, go out and vote no. Vote for your freedom. Vote for your future. And remember, you're not voting to leave the European Union. You're not voting to leave the euro. You have every right to say no to austerity and remain in the euro. Because remember, the European economic community that you joined and the European Union of today and the euro, uh, at least at the beginning, back in the 80s and then to some degree still during the early 90s, they were not based on neoliberal economics. They were not based on the Washington consensus. They were not based on this insane austerity psychosis, Abbauvan, that uh, we talked about 
in previous uh, programs. Remember, the European construct based on two things, social democratic pro-labor ideology, anti-communist though it may be, but social democratic and labor, pro-labor, and Catholic social doctrine. So it was the social democrats, the trade unionists, and the conservative Catholics who came together, right? And Leo the Thirteenth, De Rerum Novarum, the the need for unions, the need for a decent standard of living, the right that workers have to decent treatment and uh, and uh, a standard of living for their families to keep the families together. All of that was part of the implied contract. So who did a bait and switch on Greece? Now you're told that it's a debt enforcement community, right? It's essentially uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the debt collector. The Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine has now become the debt collecting corollary to the Treaty of Rome. It's a monstrosity. So fight back. And you've got to set an example, you Greeks. You, Hellenes, you, Danai, you have to uh, fight back. You've got to inspire the Portuguese. You've got to inspire the Spanish. You've got to inspire the Italians and the French. And even here in the United States, we have some people that could use quite a bit of inspiration and might indeed respond well to it. Now, a couple of interesting things. Alexis Tsipras is growing into a statesman. He's gaining in confidence. He's gaining in authority. I've seen a couple of uh, comments this week from Greek commentators who try to point out that um, at the beginning, Tsipras and Varoufakis actually thought that there might be some reserve of solidarity or humanity or even rationality in the European institutions, and they thought they could negotiate a better deal than Samaras, uh, somehow reduce the austerity. And of course, they found that this is not true. It's actually the opposite. It's that Merkel and Schäuble and Juncker and Draghi and Tusk and the rest of them actually decided almost six months ago, five months ago, that they would not negotiate in good faith and that instead they would go for regime change. U.S. regime change is done with bombers. This is now German and IMF and uh, European Central Bank regime change. And notice uh, Paolo Batista, the Latin American director of the uh, on the board of the International Monetary Fund, has admitted this week, and you know this if you follow my Twitter feed, of the 240 billion euros in bailout funds that were lent to Greece, 90 percent never left Frankfurt, never left Paris, never got to Greece. 90 percent of that money went straight to the Deutsche Bank, other German banks, Sakgen, Société Générale of France. That was a bailout of those banks, not of Greece. Greece got 10 percent, 24 billion euros, chicken feed, nothing. So this is unjust. This is illegitimate. The debt is illegal. Greeks vote against austerity. Now, even even within this, uh, it gets worse and worse uh, in his speech. Uh, again, Tsipras, looking more and more like a statesman every day, has pointed to an international monetary fund report. This IMF report was issued here in Washington on Thursday, and it is essentially a concession that the IMF admits, they confess, that the debt burden of Greece is unsustainable. They need substantial debt relief including write-offs by European partners of loans guaranteed by taxpayers. Well, we'll save the taxpayers. Let the zombie banks be left holding the bag. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Happy 4th of July to the world. And uh, we did the down with routine. Let's also say down with Howard Zinn, the fake historian, the denigrator, right? The person who couldn't see any human greatness anywhere in the history of the United States, claimed that the United States was always a force for evil. That is simply incompetent. That is a completely outrageous, lying, ignorant statement. Sure, uh, problems today and problems along the way. But to simply write this off as an exercise in racism, colonialism, and God knows what else, that is absolute nonsense. That 
indicates that somebody doesn't zin did not understand the principal issues in modern history. This was the the mushhead history of the world by the poor late uh, Howard Zinn. So um, unfortunately, his influence is so pervasive. His stupid book is still read by unsuspecting dupes in classrooms all across the United States. Right? We'll have to sweep that away. Maybe there'll be a, uh, a collective effort to uh, to set that record straight in some accessible form. Show you who the real villains are, not the ones he says. And uh, at the same time, uh, the lights and shadows, right? In other words, a balanced and realistic uh, view. But now to get back to our issue, Greece, time to vote no. Vote no. If you have to go back to Greece and vote no, then do it. You've still got a chance to get on a plane. And we have actually some members of the tax Wall Street Party who are going back to a vote no. At the same time, though, you've got to tell that government, get ready to nationalize the central bank. Get ready to seize that central bank and go for credit for production. If you are forced out of the euro, and this cannot be excluded, given the insanity, right? Wahnsinn herrscht in Berlin. Insanity rules Berlin. Abbau von herrscht in Berlin. Okay, so they're crazy. You don't know what they're going to do. So you got to be ready to nationalize that central bank. In other words, you start issuing drachmas from a nationalized central bank. And the way you reflate the Greek economy with drachmas is if you have to, and I'm not recommending it, but if that's all there is, you can do it. Credit for production, 0% long-term, multi-decade or century bonds for the main purposes of uh, of reviving the economy. We went, we went through the points. You can find the detailed program now written up on tarpley.net, tarpley.net. And you can also get it, you can find it through the Twitter feed, Webster G. Tarpley. So take a look at those. Uh, it's a matter of seizing the central bank if you're under the, the drachma, which again, we, we hope to avoid. And this, when you're voting in the referendum, that's not voting to leave the euro. You're, you, there's no mechanism. There's no mechanism for seceding from the euro, and there is no mechanism for anybody kicking you out of the euro. And they won't do it. I still, I still think that uh, there will be a moment where they blink or where uh, Merkel uh, could be visited by a committee of German exporters and told that her performance is incompetent, that her buffoonery, stupidity, and, uh, and posturing have to end, and that uh, Schäuble should roll off into the sunset. Uh, a lot of these people deserve to spend more time with their families, I guess is the, uh, the acceptable way here in Washington to, uh, to recommend that they be ousted. All right, so let's get back, though, to this interesting IMF report. Remember now, last Thursday, uh, day, yesterday, uh, the International Monetary Fund came out with a report in which it's it's called the debt sustainability analysis, uh, and it's got to do with the ability of Greece to pay. The finding: Greece's public finances will not be sustainable without substantial debt relief, possibly including write-offs by European partners of loans guaranteed by taxpayers. Well, just cancel the loans. End them, write them off. And the zombie bankers, the zombie bankers are in every case the wards of the governments. The Deutsche Bank would not exist without bailouts. Barclays, Sakjen, Unicredito, the rest of them, they're all creatures of the governments that saved them from their derivatives bankruptcy back in 2008. So what is this? We're told that it can't be done. Well, it has to be done. It is a physical impossibility. I would be much, much more adamant than this report seems to be, although the report is a step in the right direction. The debt sustainability analysis needed to conclude it is physically impossible in the material universe as we see it for this debt to be paid. Can't be done. It can't even be serviced. It can't be maintained. You can't get blood out of a stone. You can't get blood out of a turnip. So back off, Schäuble, back off, Merkel, Draghi, Juncker, the junk man. Okay, so uh, Tsipras went on television yesterday, I believe. It's the 2nd of July. And in a televised appeal, he said, look, you got to vote no. And notice that the IMF bureaucracy even agrees 
with the Greek government. The Greek parliament has concluded the debt is illegal. The Greek government uh, argues that it simply cannot be maintained and that we need their position, I think, remains 50 percent debt reduction within the framework of a new London debt conference of 1953, where Germany, despite the crimes of the Nazis, which cannot be forgotten, was given a 50 percent debt write off by its victims, victims. So this huffing and puffing from the Bildzeitung about the Greeks as lazy and so forth is hypocritical. And uh, you forget so soon the favors that were done for you when you uh, were in bad shape and you would have you might have expected a very draconian treatment. You were treated with forbearance. So why don't you reciprocate? You must reciprocate. That's the great principle of international affairs. So. Uh, not only do we have the uh, the fact that this um, <laughs> this this report was issued, but that the uh, eurozone governments uh, that that various forces in um, in the, on the in the debtor camp that they wanted to suppress the report. How about that? <laughs> Europeans, this is, I'm reading from Reuters, Paul Taylor in Brussels reports at 1.25 in the afternoon today, July 3rd, exclusive, Europeans tried to block IMF debt report on Greece, according to sources. Eurozone countries tried in vain to stop the IMF from publishing a gloomy analysis of Greece's debt burden, which the leftist government, Syriza, Cyprus, says vindicates its call to voters to reject bailout terms. Sources with the, familiar with the situation said on Friday. The document was released in Washington on Thursday, and it said, again, what, what we've just uh, told you, that debt relief has to be included, and they need 50 billion euros over the next three years to keep themselves afloat. We might, we can certainly reduce that using dirigistic American system uh, methods. So there you go. The Eurogogs and Eurocrats tried to suppress the report. Back in a minute. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So again, vote no. Vote down with the IMF. Get rid of this monstrous institution. It has been hijacked by these uh, financier oligarchs. It has no success stories. And this woman, Lagarde, known in this program as Lagarde, uh, Lagarde, she should go back to her tanning bed. She should have a Hermes bag in one hand and a Birkin bag in the other and go to her tanning bed and live the life of a sybaritic parasite which is what she is. She's an absolute cretin. And uh, she's also, of course, she's in, in odor of extreme corruption. Payoffs, kickbacks, God knows what else are all attributed uh, to her. But now, stepping back a little bit from the Greek situation, we now have the following perspective. The Chinese stock market has now gone down 30% in the last uh, couple of weeks. It's an interesting backdrop or atmospheric. I don't think that the Chinese situation is exactly out of control. 30%, however, is one third. So this is obviously a downdraft. And I think for many institutions in the West, uh, it was not uh, anticipated. It was not uh, predicted. So uh, the, the Chinese government says stock manipulators are at work. Well, possibly, uh, couldn't rule it out. But, of course, uh, there are bubbles, right? And um, if you take the capitalist road, especially if you take the finance capital road, that's what you got to expect. Now, um, what we need to look at otherwise, the Ukrainian bankruptcy, right? the Ukrainian default, widely expected on July 26th when uh, $2.6 billion of bonds come due approximately, uh, it looks like strong arming and arm twisting death threats and God knows what uh, will uh, have uh, produced some softening of the hardline positions of certain greedy 
uh, debtors, de creditors, excuse me, creditors of Greece, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine, creditors of Ukraine who wanted their money uh, 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, they won't get that. But now we, we, it looks like there's a little bit more give. And according to this, then on uh, July 2nd, yesterday, we had uh, a certain mm, you know, a le less softening in the prices of these Ukrainian uh, bonds. Uh, so the, the Ukrainian bonds have now gone up about 2.4 cents, two and a half cents, let's say, to 50 cents on the dollar as of uh, five o'clock in the afternoon yesterday in uh, Kiev. The government in Kiev has threatened to stop servicing its euro bonds if the proposal, including write downs, they want write downs of principle. How can they get that? <laughs> if it were, if their, their proposal is not accepted, they're gonna stop servicing uh, euro bonds. So they demand write downs, but Greece can't have them, right? This is like uh, the two cases, right? The double standard, the hypocrisy, the lying. And this, oh, this is Lagarde, this is Merkel, Draghi, all these people. They have double standards, right? It's all political uh, judgment, right? In one case, they want regime change in Greece. And then in Ukraine, they want to prop up a fascist clique. So uh, that's all going on. And we're continuing to monitor the statements of this awful woman, Natalie Jaresko, J-A-R-E-S-K-O. This is the Chicago gun mall now functioning, functioning as finance minister of Greece. So you look at all this stuff, and again, this is important for Greece. The longer that Greece can hang on, the more likely it is that some friendly government might emerge in Portugal or Spain or someplace unexpected. And the other thing is that the, the, uh, the arrogance and the uh, uh, overweening outrageous practices of these financier oligarchs might be chastened if they think that they're dealing with uh, severe problems in Ukraine, possible debt crisis all over the world. Now, remember, it's not about the euro in that sense, right? The Greek people, we have polls now, 70% of the Greek population want to keep the euro, keep the euro. But of course, voting no means keep the euro, dump the killer austerity. Why not? Killer austerity is not written into the Treaty of Rome, nor the other founding document, not even the Treaty of Lisbon. No killer austerity necessarily in it. So um, there we have that. Now, a couple of other things to notice on this. Libertarians, always uh, special cases of uh, ineptitude and uh, and the uh, lack of understanding. You notice who fights bankers, okay? Not libertarians. They don't fight bankers. It takes a leftist like Tsipras, Varoufakis, right? A populist leftist, not a mushhead, but a populist leftist, pro-working class, pro-working people with a national dimension, right? Not anti-Greek, not anti-government. You become the government. That's the point. You want to be the government and use those government powers to break the, the neo-feudal, predatory financier oligarchy. So again, the commentary is, you think libertarians fight for the people? They don't. They fight for their own greed. That's all they know. So they are uh, headed for the trash can of history, just like the Confederate States of America went into the trash can of history. Now, a couple of other uh, items that we should just look at briefly. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this is funny um, that uh, the well the U.S. Iran talks are going on once again. We want war avoidance. We want this thing to be finessed, papered over, whatever it takes. Take away the possibility of a big war in the Middle East and try to lock in whoever becomes president in 2016, make sure that they have a very hard time starting a war in the Middle East. So we, we're wishing um, good luck and early success to those talks. And we're sick and tired of these self-imposed deadlines, whether it's by June 30th or not. Who cares about this? We're talking about avoiding a regional war 
and God knows maybe World War III. We've got the new U.S. defense policy that singles out Russia as a national security threat. This is absolute garbage. It's absolute garbage. And you can see, for example, the U.S. withdrawal, withdrawal from Afghanistan was only possible because of generous cooperation from Russia. And there's all kinds of anti-terrorist cooperation. The Tsarnaev brothers, Russia gave not one but two warnings, one to the FBI, one to the CIA. Shut those guys down. Oh, no, that wasn't clear enough. That wasn't explicit enough. So uh, we can see what's going on here. So there, there was loyal cooperation on the side of Russia and very, very fishy rogue operations on the part of CIA and FBI. Now, the other one, Egypt. The terrorists, this is ISIS or Al-Qaeda, uh, attacking in the Sinai now, and they've killed dozens and dozens of Egyptian military with these surprise attacks on checkpoints in the Sinai. Militant attacks in Sinai killed scores of Egyptian military on Wednesday, uh, July 1st. Uh, the army says 17 soldiers were killed and 100 militants. Uh, local media says 70 soldiers and civilians uh, were killed. So what is that? Um, I'm afraid we have to look at uh, Hamas. We have to look at the Muslim Brotherhood. Some of their honchos are getting uh, their sentences in, uh, in Cairo. But this is Hamas operating out of Gaza, and it's time to... Uh, Stop that support from terrorists, Hamas. Washington, D.C. Now, there are two demonstrations going on in Athens. There's the yes demonstration and the popular no demonstration. And even France 24 in their coverage has admitted that the yes demonstration is composed of rich people with high fashion designer handbags and designer shoes and designer clothes. And those are the wealthy. And they say yes, because the austerity does not, not hit them so hard. The France 24 has had to, to admit that the no demonstration is significantly bigger. So in the dueling demonstrations, the no comes in ahead of it. But enough of me. Let's go to Athens and talk to Michael Chiotinas, who is coming directly from the demonstration and is about to return to the demonstration. Michael, welcome. Yes, exactly. I just, I'm just just back from the demonstration. And when we finish, I'm going to go back again. There's... Um, uh, uh, Tsipras is going to speak to the demonstration, he's going to make a, a speech. Uh, there's a concert that's going to be held there uh, by uh, very important artists uh, who say no. There are people from uh, Spain, there are people from Portugal, there are people from Germany, from France, from all left parties, are there in St. Dagmar Square um, making a... Uh, Speeches, giving speeches to the world, to the to the people gathered, um, it's it's um, a gathering like nothing else that I've ever seen in Athens. You see uh, rivers of people um, until you, you the eye cannot see the end of the of those streams of people. I I I got out of there uh, using the um, the metro rail, and there were streams of people coming out of the metro to the heading towards the demonstration. So here, the climate, in the, on the other hand, the climate is, um, is one of a coming regime change. Uh, Tsipras announced the referendum uh, with a yes or no to the ultimatum by the lender institutions. Uh, he called the Greek people... Um, he asked the Greek people to give him the strength to say no to ultimatums, to say no to the bullying of democracy by the European institutions. But the thing is, starting from, the, from this day, the, from the next day, the European ruling class, along with its puppets in Greece, funded a media campaign to change the question. The, the important thing is 
to change the image of reality. They are trying to change the view of what's at stake here. They, they have transformed the question from, in, in public opinion from, from yes or no to the ultimatum by the Troika to a question of yes or no to Europe itself, which is crazy because Tsipras comes out every day. Of course, they don't show Tsipras. They show, uh, I don't know, prime ministers, uh, Samaras, and um, any academic who thinks that uh, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this plan is viable, uh, even though the IMF today came out with a report saying this is, this is not viable. Um, and this propaganda is taking place in an, in, in an intensity, in a scale that is unprecedented. I've never seen this. I don't, I don't remember anything like this before in my lifetime. Maybe it can be compared to the uh, 9-11 terror campaign. You know, be afraid, mm -hmm. be scared, always. Right. Tsipras makes appeals every day to the Greek people. He gives the message that there is nothing to fear but fear itself, like the famous phrase by FDR. But the media is not alone in this fear campaign. It is clear to me talking with people that there is an organized propaganda by employers' unions. In any job, the employers uh, seize payment until all this is cleared, uh, without having any excuse to do that, without having any problem of paying uh, employees. One employer said, tweeted about um, whoever is going to come the, to the yes vote demonstration is going to get paid. All the other are not going to get paid. Uh, so, also, also in, in any job, the employers hand out leaflets and spread Word documents, for Christ's sake, that supposedly explain, with text, that's, uh, essays, that supposedly explain the way that a no vote will lead to a haircut of people's deposits in the banks, or how the mortgages will fall into the possession of the European Central Bank, which is, again, supposedly going to foreclose on them. I mean, the, the terror campaign is unbelievable. And, and on the one hand, the, the positive thing is that people who were apolitical for years uh, are suddenly called out to vote on things they never thought that concerned them anyway. But on the other hand, these people are very easily terrorized. And it's going to be a very difficult uh, fight to win. I, I, don't know, I don't know where it's gonna, where this is going to lead. Right now, the polls are 50-50. All right, Michael, let me just add a couple of things. There's a new uh, Reuters wire that quotes uh, Donald Tusk of Poland, who is this character, uh, the uh, head of the uh, European Council, right? The, uh, one of the organs of the European Union. And he says, quote, it is very clear that the referendum is not, not about being in the euro or not. That's not the issue. He says, maybe we will have to get used to living with a country as a member of the eurozone in bankruptcy. So there he is saying that's not the issue. You can indeed default and be bankrupt and stay in the European Union. And also Schäuble had said that last week, right? He said you could stay in the euro and even access the European uh, regional fund and these other these other funds. The other one I wonder if you know is that uh, concerning that IMF report, the, uh, the, the Reuters wire is that European governments, right? Obviously Berlin, right? Tried to stop the IMF from publishing this report that says the Greek debt burden is too big and debt relief is essential. Right, the gov European governments tried to say, IMF, suppress that report. Don't publish it. Don't inject that. So there is good ammunition coming in for the no side. Yes, of course. But n n none of this is shown in the media. In other words, this is, this is a, f a fight, internet against television. Television, if you open the uh, television set, uh, you will be terrorized. If you open the internet, you will see the truth. But it's very hard for people to not be afraid. This vote is going to go with, which is going to be um, influenced by fear itself. But, but only this is the, the, the most significant um, uh, thing in this in this campaign. And um, yes, of course, 
Berlin wants the IMF to give technical um, excuses to create a deflationary depression in Greece, but they don't want, of course, a dead haircut. Because how are we going to get a debt colony going without debt? You know, it can't be done. And this thing, this thing about the, um, you know, Greece being, being kicked out of the euro, it's insane for me. I, I mean, the euro is the weapon of political domination by Berlin in the rest of Europe. Can, I mean, it's unimaginable. Can you imagine the Roman Empire kicking out uh, a colony? <laughs> What is this? This is this is, this is insane. In other words, are we afraid of being independent of this uh, strangling by the ECB? I don't, I don't I don't think so. I think that we are Europeans. That the no vote is the European vote, which aspires to the European ideals and the European um, chart of human rights. And the yes vote is a is a is a, against. Europe, because the yes vote will break up the euro for sure. If, if the yes vote wins this Sunday, there will be a revolt against the euro in a, in a year or so. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure about this. Michael, let, can you just stay a couple of minutes? I just want you to come back in the next segment and make your final appeal to the Greek voters on yes. what to do on Sunday, okay? Just for a minute or two. Okay, welcome back to World Crisis Radio, our July 4th program, and uh, we just want to get a few final words, the last word here, from uh, Michael Chiatinas in Athens. Michael, why don't you make your appeal to the Greeks, and if you want to say a few words in Greek, that would be great too. <laughs> okay, so what I want to say uh, to my fellow citizens is that you shouldn't be afraid of the lines at the... Um, ATM machine. Forget about the lines for the ATM machine. Uh, the banks were closed by the Eurogroup and the ECB, not by your government, but even though, uh, not, don't be afraid of the lines for the ATM machine. Be afraid uh, of the lines at the unemployment agency and the food handouts. These are the lines that we had for five years and now, some, somehow, the media are trying to convince us about this, this hysteria about uh, 60 euros a day. I mean, you get 60 euros per day, per person, today, because of capital controls. And they are trying, the, the new memorandum is going to bring wages of 300 euros per month. Do you know how, many, how much is 300 euros per month? It's a lot less than 60 euros a day. So don't be afraid of this. Say no to, this, to the ultimatum against your right to be governed as you wish. It's not, about, it's not about the lenders wanting to take their money back. They don't want to take their money back. They want political domination. It's about political dom It's about uh, imposing their terms of governance not our terms of governance. This is about who has the right um, to uh, tell you how to be governed. This is um, a fight for uh, the not uh, to, to, to avoid destruction of the economy. To every strategic asset of the Greek economy is going to be destroyed if this is passed. So, no, just forget about your fears, forget about your fears about the deposits, the banks, um, the, um, the accounts of the banks are fine because you paid, because of bailouts that you paid for with your money that you borrowed. So don't be afraid of that. Be afraid of the homeless and the poor and the destitute and the and children not having, uh, you know, fainting at school um, classes inside, uh, inside, inside the schools from malnutrition. This is what you, should be, be, what you should be afraid of, not lines at the ATM machine for 60 years a day. And could we just, could we just hear a few words in Greek? I think everybody's now learned this oh, oh, uh, ohi, ohi. So no. Yes, no, ohi. Our, our, our forefathers said no to the, to the Third Reich. 
let's uh, let's say a more simple no this time, but but by the people. The people need to support the government. Υποστηρίξτε την κυβέρνηση. Δώστε την δυνατότητα στην κυβέρνηση να διαπραγματευτεί για σας. Πείτε όχι. Okay. Great. Wonderful. A great voice and a great cause. Michael, we'll be looking to you as usual, maybe even during the weekend, right? Maybe Sunday night. Okay? Thank you very much. So thank you. And Michael has, Michael Chiotinas has done a lot uh, to defend the Greek uh, government since uh, January, uh, simply by telling the truth uh, for at least a certain portion of world public opinion. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Now you go back to that demonstration and give them hell. <laughs> All right. So, World Crisis Radio uh, goes on. Now, we have to look at the, uh, first of all, we got to say a few things about the American Revolution, right? Because uh, there once was one. Actually, let me say uh, a couple of things about uh, how this all started. Uh, it's important to remember that the first rebellion against tyrannical British rule in North America occurred in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And uh, yours truly is, uh, I guess if I'm a native of anywhere, I'm a native of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. It is in Western Massachusetts. It is the county seat of Berkshire County. And it's uh, the place that is the first open rebellion resistance against British rule in North America. Uh, and let's just go to uh, the center of Great Barrington. This place is now kind of a, um, a bohemian uh, artist colony or good for rich people from New York City, but it's that was not always the case. Uh, you have Main Street, you have the courthouse. Now, I used to live on Church Street. We'll say a few words about that in a second. But um, we have the uh, Intolerable Acts, uh, we have the, uh, the tea taxes and all the rest of it, uh, complete assault on uh, on self-government, and the uh, crown uh, king, King George III, appointed a governor. The governor was his to appoint, and then the governor would uh, impose by decree all judges, sheriffs, and marshals. No town meetings except by consent of the governor. All agenda items approved by the governor in advance, otherwise nothing. And the courts were made responsible for enforcing these intolerable acts or coercion acts. So, and I'm reading now from uh, published sources on the internet, well, well con uh, confirmed. The first response to the intolerable acts in North America was in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where 1,500 unarmed men packed the courthouse to obstruct court business. These, this event was the first open resistance to British rule in the North American colonies. And remember, it's interesting to note that it was not just 13 colonies, there were actually 26 British colonies in North America, including Canada, including West Florida, places that they had ripped from uh, the French and the Spanish in the various wars. So uh, on the front lawn of the Great Barrington Courthouse, we find a, uh, a stone marker, a little bit rough edged, but there it is. And it says, near this spot stood the first courthouse of Berkshire County, erected 1764. And here on August 16th, 1774, occurred the first open resistance to British rule in America. Now, we have the uh, interesting historian Raphael, who writes about the uh, up upheaval in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I think that one is September 6th. But sorry, Raphael, Great Barrington takes the palm with the first open resistance to British rule and Berkshire in the Berkshire County Courthouse. And it's still there, out on the front lawn, uh, Massachusetts fiscal marker uh, placed by the town of Great Barrington, and it's there. So uh, the the voice you are hearing from this program 
is the voice of a certain tradition, uh, the revolutionary one. Uh, and that's the, that's the story of Great Barrington. Now, the other thing we want to point out, the text of the Declaration of Independence, this was the best thing uh, Thomas Jefferson ever did. Notice, he did it under the supervision of Benjamin Franklin, who told him what to write. Uh, but of course, Jefferson was a talented writer. Too bad that later on he was captured by the slavery interest in Virginia and turned against the central government of the United States, right? He was feuding with Hamilton. Hamilton represented the future, efficient government, uh, self-defense against the British, economic development, and all the rest of it. Alexander Hamilton is the key man. Keep him on the $10 bill. Don't mix that one up. Better yet, get rid of that nasty Andrew Jackson, who was himself a disciple of Aaron Burr, another arch traitor. But in the case of Jefferson, he uh, went astray. The weakness of the United States revealed in the War of 1812 is largely a result of the malfeasance and nonfeasance of Jefferson. He wanted a weak central government. Why? Because a strong central government might interfere with slavery. Slavery being the big obsession of these characters uh, at the time. However, let's look at the Declaration of Independence, something that he did. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we've gone through the primacy of uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts in this entire uh, enterprise of American independence, then followed by other towns in Massachusetts and then by other places around what is now the United States. Uh, but Great Barrington gets the palm for being there first. And uh, Church Street, as I mentioned, was uh, one of the one of the places involved. And uh, that's where W.E.B. Du Bois grew up uh, later in the 19th century. And that's actually where I lived uh, at a time in my uh, boyhood. So the Declaration of Independence, uh, as I've said repeatedly, adumbrates a conspiracy theory. It's all based on a conspiracy theory. The long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, evincing a design to reduce them under absolute de despotism, you got to throw off that government. And the conclusion Thomas Jefferson, as edited and directed by Benjamin Franklin and some others, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having indirect object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. So absolute despotism and absolute tyranny, but through all different governments, right? People change, governments change, policy remains the same. So does that mean that Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were kooks, conspiracy buffs, paranoids? Well, let's also look at Bernard Balin of Harvard and his book, The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, 1967. His conclusion is that the American Revolution is based on a single unifying conspiracy theory actually coming from the British political writer Edmund Burke, who was quite respectable in many quarters today, uh, they had made similar allegations about the British government in a slightly different uh, context. But the conspiracy then focused on George III and his court. And this was the unifying belief of the right wing of the American Revolution, the left wing, the center, all of them uh, believed this. So the idea is that the policies of Great Britain are not just mistaken or even evil, they violate the principles on which freedom rested. And uh, there was uh, a surreptitious effort by plotters against liberty, both in England and America. So George Washington, in his Fairfax Res the Fairfax Revolu Resolution of 1774, along with George Mason, eh, not the greatest, uh, and bought by his university, bought by Koch today, Washington says there was a, quote, regular systematic plan of oppression. The British government was endeavoring by every piece of art and despotism to fix the slack shackles of slavery upon us. Now, we'll talk about slavery in a minute. Uh, Washington says, beyond the smallest doubt, these measures are the result of deliberation conspiracy. I am as fully convinced as I am of my own existence that there has been a regular systematic plan formed to enforce them. Now, I'm reading from chapter 13 of 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA, 
Get the fifth edition. Actually, if you want this in chapter seven, I'm sorry, in chapter 13, any edition will be okay. But if you're going to get buy what buy it, get the fifth edition if you can find it. Thomas Jefferson wrote a pamphlet in 1774, uh, a series of oppressions uh, done by the British, begun at a, a specified period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers too plainly proves a deliberate and systematic plan of reducing us to slavery, 1774. John Adams, 1774, quote, the conspiracy was first regularly formed and begun to be executed in 1763 or four. The conspiracy was profound, secret, dark, and deep. It was a junto conspiracy, and it was a junta, a secret uh, committee. And, of course, the, the Essex junto or Essex junta in Massachusetts was, a, was an example of this stuff a little bit later. Um, Governor Bernard of Massachusetts said a faction has organized a conspiracy against the customs administration. It is a secret, power-hungry cabal. Uh, let's see. You get the idea. Um, the explosion of long smoldering fears of ministerial conspiracy was by no means an exclusively American phenomenon. It was experienced in England, too. So that's Bernard Balin, who got the Bancroft Prize in American history, a Harvard professor. This was before the shackles of political correctness came down on us. Uh, let's also add that Lincoln uh, alleged a conspiracy by President Polk, which I believe is amply demonstrated, uh, to start the war with Mexico in 1847, I guess, uh, 18, 1846, sorry. And uh, we also know <laughs> that the most famous speech in American political history, Lincoln's House Divided Speech, also adumbrates a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. And uh, let's see if we can uh, get the good quote from that. It's, he goes through a bunch of these people. Um, we cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert. Now, Washington says deliberation. Lincoln says pre-concert. But when we see a lot of framed timbers, different portion, portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places by different workmen, by Stephen Douglas, senator, Democrat party leader, presidential candidate, Franklin Pierce, president, Roger Taney, Taney, uh, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, author of the Dred Scott decision, and James Buchanan, president uh, under which secession occurred. We can see that these timbers join together. They exactly make the frame of a house or a mill. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen Douglas and Franklin Pierce and Roger Tawney and James Buchanan all understood each other from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn before the first lick was struck, says Abraham Lincoln in the House Divided speech. So, gosh, uh, you tell me about uh, whether it's possible to do political analysis. If you're dealing with an oligarchy, the obvious thing is uh, there's got to be pre-concert or deliberation. So uh, that's the Declaration of Independence. And uh, remember, we also have to thank the uh, international powers that made this possible. France joined the United States in 1778, and we'll, we'll review the, uh, the three countries, really, that get the, uh, the thanks of a grateful America on July 4th, and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we've done our commentary on the American Revolution and that vigorous intellectual life that allowed people to see deliberation and pre-concert without being slandered as paranoids and kooks and conspiracy theorists. Although I have to admit, there are lots and lots of people who are kooks and paranoids who are out there selling conspiracy theories. Today, let's not forget little... Ron Paul, the infamous leprechaun, who's out there telling you that you should put your future under the control of his 
uh, a very dubious uh, stockbroker, a guy who has been uh, a, a firm which has been fined uh, by the United States uh, government, the Securities and Exchange Commission, for essentially trying to rip off uh, some people. This Stansbury fined $1.5 million. Uh, so Ron Paul is preaching the apocalypse. Uh, this we do not uh, share. And it's not because of governments, Ron. It's because of finance oligarchs, bankers in particular, and of course the governments they control. That's That goes without saying. So the answer to that is though, not to tear down the government, as Jeff Davis wanted to do, but build up a better one. Remember that song, right? Old Abe Lincoln came out the wilderness, and the key verse is, old Jeff Davis tore down the government many long years ago, but old Abe Lincoln built up a better one many long years ago. So that's it. Jeff Davis, president of the Confederate States of America. Now, it's 4.15 on the afternoon of July 3rd. Let's go to William Faulkner in his famous screed, Intruder in the Dust. This is uh, obviously a writer that we condemn on aesthetic grounds because of his lack of realism, but he does have some insights. For every Southern boy, 14 years old, not once, but wherever he wants it, there is the instant when it's still not yet two o'clock on that afternoon in July 1863. The brigades are in position behind the rail fence. The guns are laid and ready in the woods and the furled flags are loosened to break out. And Pickett himself with his long oiled ringlets, Pickett obviously used greasy kid stuff, and his hat in one hand, probably, and his sword in the other, looking up the hill and waiting for Longstreet to give him the word. And it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened. It hasn't even begun yet. It hasn't begun. There's still time for it not to begin against that position and those circumstances, which made more men than Garnett and Kemper and Armistead and Wilcox. These are all Southern Brigadier Generals. A lot of them got killed. Look grave, and it's going to begin. And we all know that we have come too far with too much at stake for the moment, and it doesn't even need a 14-year-old boy to think that maybe this time, maybe this time, with all this much to lose and all this much to gain, Pennsylvania to gain, Maryland, the world, the golden dome of Washington itself, to crown with desperate and unbelievable victory the gamble made two years ago. Well, uh, that's the, uh, the myth. Uh, and that seems to go around in the minds of a lot more people than you would think. Right? The libertarians don't ever seem to have gotten over that um, moment because the Paul Tards, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, represent the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish right of Freemasonry, which also brought you people like Trent Lott, Jesse Helms, Strom Thurmond. You go down uh, the list. Now, once again, we're told that the Confederate Constitution or the Confederacy is not based on slavery. Well, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, put out this infamous statement saying, the U.S. was founded on the idea that all men are created equal. The Confederacy is founded on the opposite idea that they're radically unequal and therefore we have to have racial discrimination, slavery and white supremacy. Uh, and that's the Confederate bedrock position. But interestingly, a couple of years after the war, when Stevens started to write his self-justifying, self-serving memoirs and other tracts, he said, oh, no, slavery was only incidental. That was not the big thing. Right? In, in the moment, it's the only thing. And later on, it becomes uh, incidental. Notice that in the Confederate Constitution, uh, we do not have we the people of the United States. We have each state, the people of each state in their sovereign and independent character. Well, it's easier for oligarchs to d dominate a state. That's why states' rights is the most reactionary slogan in American history. In the Confederate Constitution, there's no general welfare clause, not in the preamble and not in the tasks of the Congress. Interestingly, there's no common defense clause either. They want a weak government that is militarily too weak to impose reforms, such as the abolition of slavery. But the general welfare clause is a dead uh, giveaway. So it's a weak government. Uh, notice that states have the ability to impeach federal officials, confederal, confederate of CSA officials, under this Confederate Constitution of 1861 in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, free trade. There's no protective tariff under the Confederate system, 
nothing. Revenue tariff, maybe. Protective tariff, no. And is explicitly forbidden in the Confederate Constitution to support industry, to support industrialization and modernization and the application of science, technology, and industry that can make a better life. My God, we probably have some leftist mushheads who would go along with this. No support for industry under the CSA. And the, the Confederate government will not build infrastructure, no infrastructure, no roads, ports, docks, and uh, today energy facilities and so forth. The Confederacy, like the Republican Party, its spawn, has the line item veto. Every bill has to be about one thing, and that's stated in the title, so that's the line item veto. No riders are allowed, right? So they get a weak, a weak legislature. Term limits, a, a single six-year term. Confederate president is a lame duck from the word go. So you have a weak executive, a weak legislature, no common defense against, uh, well, again, you'll get, you won't have any military power vis-a-vis -vis the states, and no general welfare. And then concerning slavery, uh, it is expressly forbidden to abolish or impair slavery according to this Confederate Constitution. And only slave states can join. Now, remember, the alternative was the Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln program of a national bank, a protective tariff, and infrastructure. In, in those, their terms those days, internal improvements paid for by the federal government, even if they're only in one state. Who cares about that? They can be in New Orleans or Galveston and be of national importance. Uh, I also have to point out the three-fifths clause uh, in the American Constitution. The U.S. Constitution never says slavery. It doesn't. It says people that are held to servitude. But notice when they say three-fifths of those are going to be counted in the census for congressional rep representation, that includes white people. That includes white uh, indentured servants. And the argument was actually if you are under the control of in effect, an owner or an overseer, your vote will be controlled by that guy. So there was some uh, argument about this. It is not purely a racist measure. White people were counted as three-fifths too if they were uh, indentured servants. Obviously, we have to go way beyond this. And under the U.S. Uh, system, uh, it can be done. So that's one of them. The other one I've, I've been hearing now uh, the encomium of Robert E. Lee. Um, well, let's take a look at uh, Robert E. Lee. This is the lost cause, right? In other words, the we have essentially people who are scoundrels, like Nathan Bedford Forrest, a uh, a war criminal who deserved severe punishment, uh, or Jubal Early, right, an unreconstructed uh, racist and secessionist, and of course treason and slavery go together. Um, Robert E. Lee, what's wrong with Robert E. Lee? Fundamentally, he's a tactician. He's not a strategist. He has no idea of a war strategy. Right? You think of something like the Schlieffen plan. He could never do that. He just doesn't think that way. He thinks of it as a series of battles, not as a continental or indeed worldwide campaign. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, our July 4th edition. Happy Independence Day to all. Down with Empire. Uh, and uh, don't uh, forget the, uh, the the internal structure of the Declaration of Independence and other key uh, statements, which a quackademic of today would call a conspiracy theory. So remember, we have to thank France as of 1778, Spain as of 1779, and the Netherlands as of 1780, the Dutch, for helping the United States to defeat the British and gain independence. We all know people like uh, Marquis de Lafayette, Admiral Rochambeau, uh, Admiral de Grasse. Uh, we also have to think of the Spanish uh, Admiral Galvez. Uh, when Galvez captured West Florida, he was then able to go out into the uh, Caribbean. This freed up de Grasse on the Allied side, who was then able to go and trap the British army in Yorktown so that it could then be forced to surrender by Washington and his right-hand man, Alexander Hamilton. But now we're back to the, uh, the Confederacy here. Um, Robert E. Lee, first of all, a mere tactician, not a strategist, and as a tactician, 
addicted to the frontal assault with maximum casualties among his own troops. The most famous, the aforementioned Pickett's Charge, essentially a massacre by sending these frayed regiments into the, uh, the teeth of concentrated musket fire, but above all, shell fire and canister. Uh, indeed, in the last phase, double canister, right? When Alonzo Cushing uh, of the battery there at the high watermark bloody angle uh, turned to his division commander and said, I'll give them one more shot, Webb. That was double canister. Sometimes they'd even do shell without fuse, so the, the shell would explode almost as soon as it got out of the barrel of the cannon and explode among the uh, the attackers. So this was a, a massacre. But uh, a year before at Malvern Hill in the Seven Days Battles, Lee did the same thing, frontal assault. Uh, and therefore, he did not husband and conserve his most precious resource, resource, which was manpower. The southern manpower was limited. The northern manpower tended to be unlimited because of the larger population, but also because of the continuous flow of immigrants who wanted to come into the north from Europe. Uh, and uh, they were no, nobody wanted to go to the south because of the wretchedly low standard of living there. So. Uh, Lee, as a tactician, of course, his his reputation is expanded by the fact that McDowell was incompetent, Pope was incompetent, McClellan. Very, it's a very clear case with McClellan. He didn't want to attack the Southern social order. Right, he wanted to maintain it. McClellan, as a Philadelphia socialite, had a class interest in keeping the Confederacy. Uh, from being crushed. In other words, he didn't want to destroy Lee's army because he regarded Lee's army as the bulwark of slavery and slavery, therefore, the basis of the Southern social system. And McClellan obviously felt that if the Southern aristocracy oligarchy were swept away, then the Northern patricians, people like McClellan himself, would not be able to enjoy this position in society. So the big question on the Union side is, will it be a revolutionary war to attack the backward oligarchical aristocratic planter system of the South, right? The people who are living in the world of Sir Walter Scott and romanticism, or Jeb Stewart, Pickett with his oily curls. Uh, well, it had to be, right? So that's the, the, the push towards emancipation. Burnside is incompetent. Hooker is incompetent. Meade is at least minimally competent. And guess what? He wins. And then when you get Grant going on the offensive, the military issue is wrapped up within a couple of months at terrible cost. Part of the terrible cost is that the officers of the Army of the Potomac had not been on a steady diet of, uh, of victory, right? Grant's own Army of the Tennessee won every battle. Army of Tennessee, ev nothing but victory, right? Nothing but victory under Grant. Uh, Army of the Tennessee, I guess I should say. The other thing about Lee, of course, is localitis. He thinks of it as a war to protect Northern Virginia. He could have sent some forces to, say, Vicksburg. That was a big deal on July 4th, 1863. No, got to keep him in Virginia. How about sending some forces to Chattanooga a little bit later on? Follow up on Chickamauga. No, can't do that. Or send them, but then get them back. Longstreet called back as soon as possible. So severe localitis, lack of a continental strategy. And remember, underlying all of this, the entire Confederate effort, including the Antietam campaign and the Gettysburg campaign, a desire to get British and French intervention, and they couldn't get it because of Russia. So thank you to Russia on a day like this, uh, because, well, that Russian fleet in New York and the one in San Francisco meant that the British and the French were, they were, they were, their hands were tied. And remember, my lecture on the Russian fleets is the number one C-SPAN Civil War lecture of the sesquicentennial. And even more, going back to 2001, there's only the raconteur, I guess we'd call him, Shelby Foote from 2001, who still does better than I do, among the C-SPAN video archive items that deal with the American Civil War. So Lee was a frontal assault guy. He was always on the offensive. Obviously, it's great to go on the offensive if you can strike a quick knockout blow like the Schlieffen plan, but he had no such plan. Uh, Stonewall Jackson was closer to having a plan, but his plan was also simply kind of regional. 
Lee, Lee therefore settled into a war of attrition where he was going head to head with the Union in frontal assaults. This is crazy. So the lost cause is bankrupt. Lee is wrong. He does not surrender to superior numbers and resources at Adam Appomattox. He has to succumb to a superior system. The Northern system, the Union, free labor is better. The Homestead Act is better. The infrastructure of the Transcontinental Railroad, better. The things the Confederacy could not do, didn't want to do. And don't forget the question of slavery. Here's a very interesting conversation. After he was president, our soldier statesman, Ulysses S. Grant, went on a world tour. He went to Berlin and talked to Prince Otto von Bismarck, the founder and chancellor of the German Empire. So here we are in June 1878. And the question is, uh, what was the Civil War about in the United States? So Bismarck says to him, I guess that you had to save the Union as we had to save Germany, not only to save the Union, says General Grant, but to destroy slavery. And Bismarck says, yeah, but wasn't the Union the big thing? Grant says, yes, at the beginning. But as soon as slavery fired upon the flag at Fort Sumter, it was felt, we all felt, even those who did not object to slaves, that slavery had to be destroyed. We felt that it was a stain to the Union that men should be bought and sold like cattle. Well, bought and sold like cattle is the Confederate system, anchored in their constitution. Bismarck tells him about his friend Langhorn Motley, a very interesting U.S. figure, wrote some interesting books. Uh, I've written about his uh, career. Uh, Grant then sums up. There had this is Grant again. There had to be an end to slavery. Then we were fighting an enemy with whom we could not make a peace. No negotiated peace, a la McClellan. We had to destroy him. No convention, no treaty was possible. Only destruction. In other words, you couldn't temporize or compromise with slavery. It had to go, and uh, that meant that the uh, the society uh, around it also had to go. So, um, final word, Gettysburg. Um, just been there. Uh, it's a highly interesting place. Uh, the, the Park Service does a mixed job. I lament the demise of the electric map. I lament the, uh, the current arrangement of the cyclorama painting by Philip Poteau. The cylindrical projection of the entire battle is flawed in that the apparatus for people to stand on in the middle of it blocks your view. In other words, the, the ideal situation of the cyclorama would be you can stand in the middle and turn around and see everything. And this under this setup, you can't. The one at the Battle of Atlanta is even worse. But uh, it's there. All those Union regiments paid their money to put up 1,200 monuments and create the greatest monument, the greatest historical object in the Western Hemisphere. Take a look at Gettysburg. Take a look at Antietam. And uh, and don't worry so much about the Confederate flag. Think about honoring the Union dead. See you next week on World Crisis Radio.